You may be seated. All right, we are coming back into Mark chapter 14 this evening, and we're going to pick up at verse 43. Mark chapter 14 and verse 30, uh, 43, excuse me, uh, Jesus' arrest in the garden, and then, uh, Lord willing, we'll make it through the end of the chapter tonight. We've seen in Mark chapter 14 uh, the, the beginning of what it, we have described as the final master key text. Uh, in Mark's Gospel. From the beginning of our study uh, earlier this year, or excuse me, at the, at the beginning of last year, I have to remember we have a new year, don't we? Um, uh, we've talked about four master key texts that have um, uh, uh, keys that will unlock many doors in the Gospel. Chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 8, and then the passion narrative that we are in now, chapters 14 through 16, we said that if you don't really pay attention to the central ideas, the the essential concepts that are in these particular chapters of Mark's Gospel, you will still benefit greatly from a study of Mark's Gospel. You will learn, you will enjoy the stories. There is much about the Lord that you will be able to know. But if you pay attention to some of the key ideas to be found in those sections of the Gospel, you you will see a greater coherence a greater unity, uh, that you will see more clearly perhaps the the way in which certain themes develop in Mark's gospel. And I hope that by learning to read Mark's gospel in that way, it will enable you then to read the rest of the canon in a similar way. Let's begin by reading the text that is before us. First of all, verses 43 to 52 of Mark chapter 14. This is God's holy word. And immediately while Jesus was still speaking... Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to Jesus and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on Jesus and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Now a certain young man followed Jesus, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now you'll remember that in the verses we looked at last week, we saw Jesus' prayer in the garden. That's where we are, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, a name that refers to an oil press. This is an olive grove, and Jesus being the true olive tree, the true Israel of God, is now being pressed with trials. We suggested that the battle that is at issue in Jesus' passion, in his suffering, is really won here in the garden. And that is not to say that Calvary is in any way anticlimactic. Obviously, his death and then his resurrection are the consummation of his work of atonement. And yet, in many respects, it is that episode of prayer in Gethsemane that really is the turning point. And when Jesus comes up off of his face, off of his knees that third time, he resolutely moves to the entrance of the garden looking ahead to his betrayer and to the hour that has finally arrived. You'll notice the way in which Mark emphasizes the significance of this in his use of his favorite word a couple of times in the section that we just read. Mark's favorite word, of course, is the word that is most often in our English Bibles translated immediately or straightway. Notice verse 43, immediately while Jesus was still speaking, Judas arrived. And then verse 45, as soon as Judas had come, immediately he went up and greeted Jesus as his teacher. Uh, There is a sense of urgency that this is happening uh, now quickly. Things are proceeding apace because this is what we have been waiting for all along. Normally, when Mark uses the term immediately, we expect something blessed to happen. Well, something blessed is happening, but it's an awful happening at the same time. It's an awful event. It's the arrival of the traitor who has come to bring death to the Creator who came to give life. 
Mark says that Judas came with a great crowd, a great multitude. Now, we don't know exactly how many there are. Some commentators will say, well, obviously it wasn't very many. I say, obviously nothing. Mark says it was a great crowd. I assume it's a great crowd, right? But we are not imagining here thousands of people. We're not imagining the kind of crowds that Jesus fed in the wilderness. But nevertheless, a large band of people, a large band of armed men, men armed with swords and clubs, John, in his recounting of the same scene, uses a Greek word that refers to the weapon of a, of a Roman soldier, uh, uh, even, even a Roman soldier himself. So apparently, the chief priests are not only using the temple guard that would have been Jewish, but also Roman soldiers that they had at their disposal and command. They've sent a large group out because Jesus, after all, is accompanied by a band of men. There are at least 11 other men with Jesus and presumably several more. And remember the messianic expectations of the Jews. They expect the Messiah to be a king like David and Solomon. And therefore they expect the Messiah to take the throne in, a, in sort of a coup, a military action, because it will be necessary to depose the, the Romans in order to reestablish Jewish sovereignty. They're concerned that these men are prepared for that kind of action. And so they send a significant show of force, hoping to quell any resistance. It's the idea of saying, don't even bother to resist because there are too many of you, and, or too many of us rather, for you, and there is no hope. Judas comes with the authority of the Sanhedrin. You notice the threefold reference in verse 43 chief priests, scribes, and elders. That's the threefold uh, uh, composition, the threefold membership of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. And again, he has apparently Roman soldiers as well, although Mark does not draw attention to that. Mark doesn't give us a lot of details, in fact, about this group except to say that they're armed with swords and clubs, which seems rather ridiculous because, after all, Jesus has preached peace. Jesus himself is unarmed, and Jesus has been a public figure and publicly available all of the time. Now, when they come out to the garden, Judas is going to identify Jesus, and you would say, why, why would he have to do that? Jesus is you know, fantastically popular. In fact, that's part of the problem here. We've been trying to find some secret, quiet way of taking him into custody because he's so popular that we're concerned about an uprising by the people in the city. But remember that the ancient world is not as well lit as the world that you and I live in. We have so, so much uh, uh, light that even on a dark night, if you're anywhere close to the city, there, there's ambient light that, that is affecting your vision. And yet you imagine these Middle Eastern men, all bearded, probably hooded, in a pitch black garden. And now this group of men come with torches, but how well do the tor does the torchlight illuminate the faces? And, and how many of these men are they going to have to, to, to grab by the shoulders and stare in the face before they finally find the right one? Remember, their assumption is that Jesus would want to escape and that Jesus' uh, disciples would be prepared to fight. Now, neither of those assumptions proved to be correct, Peter's actions with the sword notwithstanding. But, but they, they're prepared for that possibility. And so Judas is going to be the one, knowing Jesus as well as he does, who can cut through the crowd and immediately identify the teacher. And he does so by greeting him as a rabbi and then welcoming him with a kiss, a hypocritical kiss of peace. This is uh, the normal way of greeting, even to this day in that part of the world. Now in verse 46, they lay hands on Jesus and begin to bind him, begin to take him into custody. And the next verse says that one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now either he is a colossally amazing swordsman to be able to take off an ear and not a head, or he's a fisherman who's not a particularly great swordsman and he's swinging at a head and he gets part of the ear instead. Uh, John tells us that this is Peter. Mark does not identify him. There's all kinds of speculation about why that is. Some people have suggested that because Mark's gospel is written much earlier and Peter is still perhaps alive, depending on how early you date the gospel. I think Peter is actually uh, still alive for about 20 years after this gospel is written, as a matter of fact. I, I take a very early date. But nonetheless, uh, if Peter is still alive, then maybe identifying him would, would uh, you know, put him at some risk 
uh, maybe the Romans would read the Gospel of Mark and they would want to uh, arrest him. I, I doubt that many uh, Roman uh, officials were reading the Gospel of Mark. I find that a little bit of a strained interpretation. But one possibility is that Mark, whom Peter refers to as his son in the faith in 1 Peter chapter 5, does not wish to dwell upon the shame of this moment. In fact, you notice that he does not mention that Jesus healed the man's ear. You notice that he does not mention that Jesus rebuked Peter and told him to put his sword in its place. Those might have been features that Peter would have dwelt on, perhaps not, but Mark, for whatever reason, chooses not to do so. Peter draws a sword because, as he had said earlier in the evening in the upper room, he was ready that night to give his life for Jesus, and he is prepared to prove that in his own body at this time. I mentioned this last week. I've said this in other studies, especially in our study of the Gospel of John over the last several years. I am convinced that Peter thought he was going to die that night. I am not persuaded Peter thought that he would defeat the mob I am not persuaded that as self-confident as Peter is that he thought that his swordsmanship skills were were equal to the large crowd armed with swords and clubs that confronted him. I think in Peter's mind, he probably is just hoping to buy Jesus time so that Jesus can escape. Because of course, Jesus doesn't want to be arrested. Of course, Jesus doesn't want to be executed because Jesus is going to be the king. Remember all the way back in Mark chapter 8 when Peter makes his great confession of faith and says, you are the Christ. He has in mind a political context for that confession because immediately after Jesus begins to predict with astonishing specificity his imminent death and Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. Don't talk that way. You're not going to die. I just said you're the Messiah. You're going to be the king. This is what Peter imagines. He is not prepared for Jesus to submit in that moment. This is going to be very important in understanding Peter's failure in the courtyard. His confusion, his frustration, his doubt, his anger, all is going to contribute, no doubt, to his failure at that time. Now, I I do think that perhaps Mark passes over this uh, for uh, the sake of sparing a man that he loves. But more importantly than that speculation is the reality that Mark keeps the attention focused on Jesus. He does not dwell on any of the, the kind of the secondary features of this narrative that you or I might be interested in. He could have paused. He could have cast a spotlight on Peter. He could have had a side conversation. And again, some of the other gospel writers do give us some of those extra details. Mark is focused, and you see the urgency in his twofold use of his favorite word. He's focused on the urgency of this moment. He wants us to see Jesus moving rapidly toward death. Verse 48, Jesus answers this crowd as they take him into custody. Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. He is exposing the hypocrisy of his captors. The circumstances of this arrest are absolutely absurd. Was Jesus some kind of a dangerous criminal? Was he a violent man? Was a large armed band really necessary here? Had Jesus been hard to find? I mean, is this a fugitive apprehension team that's been, you know, searching this city for weeks and now finally they've run him to the ground? No, he's been in plain sight every single day. He's been in the temple courts. He has interacted with the chief priests and elders who sent these men that night. Now, we cannot know whether any of these men in this band came to faith at a later point in time. But I don't think it's impossible to believe that some of them may have. And and with at least that possibility out there, I want you to consider what Jesus may be doing here. Obviously, he is establishing their hypocrisy. Obviously, he's making a point that later generations of believers benefit from. But do you suppose he's planting seeds of doubt in his tormentors? Do you suppose that he's pointing out the absurdity and the hypocrisy of this moment so that perhaps some of the participants later might reflect back upon this and see this moment for what it really was. The Lord sees a greater purpose at work in the events that night. He says this is the fulfillment of Scripture. This is not some unfortunate development 
I didn't manage to get myself cornered, and, and now, uh, now my plot has fallen apart. No, he says this is exactly what God intended to be done. The scriptures are fulfilled in the suffering of the Son and even in his betrayal by a disciple. And what you see, contrary to kind of the anguish at the beginning of the Gethsemane experience, what you see is Jesus very calmly, very resolutely, very contentedly resting in his, in his Father's purpose in this hour. It's begun. Right? Some of you know this, by the way. You, you, you've had an experience, maybe it was waiting for surgery. Maybe it was uh, some, some important event in your life, and it was the waiting that was the most difficult part. It was like, I, I'm, just, I'm just ready to, to get on with it. Well, it is on now. Jesus is now in custody. He has been arrested by soldiers, including Roman soldiers, who are operating under the authority of the chief priest. His suffering has now fully begun. And what happens next? Verse 50, then they all forsook him and fled. And they all is obviously not a reference to the armed band that's there to arrest him. It's a reference to the disciples. They all forsook him. Now, you may say, no, 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 no. Peter follows him into the courtyard that night. Yes, but Peter forsook him. You may say, well, no, no. John also accompanied the beloved disciple, went into that courtyard and was there that night along with Peter. And we see him later in John's gospel at the foot of the cross. Yes, but the Bible says they all forsook him. You and I need to understand that that is a statement not just about geographic proximity. It may be true that the majority of the disciples were nowhere to be found. They were nowhere near Jesus in the day following this arrest. But the fact that one or two of them were at times in proximity to him does not change the reality that they forsook him because they are standing at a distance. They are standing at a distance. And they are standing there because there is evidently some doubt in their minds. Mark says this without any mitigation. He doesn't offer any kind of qualification. He just says they all forsook him and fled. And what Jesus said would happen has now happened. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. This is the fulfillment of what was spoken by the prophet Zechariah that Jesus reaffirms in the upper room. And the disciples all remember, not just Peter, but all of them insist that will not happen. And sure enough, it has. And then Mark includes a unique feature. And this again, I hope, I hope after studying 14 chapters of Mark's gospel, you will never again believe the lie that Mark is just this abbreviation, this abridgment that doesn't really have anything unique to offer gospel studies. I hope now you appreciate the fact that not only does Mark include some material that's not found in any of the other gospels, but even the material that is shared, he presents frequently in a unique way. He gives details, uh, levels of insight, thematic relationships and emphases that we simply don't see in the other writers. And by the way, if we're studying one of the other Gospels, we're going to say the same things about that Gospel. It's not to say that Mark is better than the other Gospels, but it is to say that Mark is equal to the other Gospels. He doesn't need to be treated like a Cliff Notes version to the life of Christ. And what, what Mark includes in verses 51 and 52 is not found in any of the other writers. He says, now a certain young man followed Jesus, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. So this is kind of weird. I was like, so that's a little bizarre, right? Someone's running around in the garden, following Jesus around with a sheet wrapped around his body. And, and as, the, as the soldiers are like grabbing Jesus, they're grabbing at other disciples, they all forsook him and fled. Fleeing indicates that they're running away from something. In other words, perhaps the mob would have been willing to take all of them into custody that night. And they don't succeed in doing so because everybody bolts. And then Peter and John only follow later at a distance. Think about that when we come to Peter's denial in just a moment, right? Just put a pin in that idea. This young man, apparently they grab hold of him, but they grab hold of the sheet. And he pulls out of it, he's got nothing on underneath, and he just goes running off naked. Now, what is this about? Well, a couple of observations. 
First of all, the fact that he is wrapped in a linen cloth may suggest a wealthy family, right? That, that this is not just an ordinary bed sheet. This is, this is actually a piece of fabric that would have some value. The fact that he's wrapped in a sheet and not properly clothed may suggest that he has come out rather quickly. Maybe he was unprepared. He has rushed to the garden in haste. And if he is following Jesus, as Mark says, then it's not unreasonable to begin connecting some of these dots and to speculate that this young man knew Jesus before and was a follower of him, but was in bed asleep when news reaches him about the arrest in the garden. You could imagine him being awo awakened, perhaps because someone sees Judas moving toward the garden with a band of officers. And he grabs the sheet on his bed and he wraps it up and he takes off to where he knows Jesus will be because all of the disciples know where Jesus will be. Remember, that's how Judas finds him there is because Jesus used that garden regularly when they were in Jerusalem. He grabs the cloth from the bed. He runs there, but he's too late. He sees Jesus has already been taken into custody and now the guard sees him and he too must flee along with the other followers of Christ. The Greek word used to describe this young man as well as the young men that grab him is often used in, in the, the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, and other literature to describe strong young men. And I don't, I don't want to overdevelop that idea. I'm not suggesting that he's a bodybuilder or uh, you know, some kind of a, a super soldier. But, but what I'm suggesting is that the strong young men are fleeing naked in the hour that Jesus is arrested. And that's an important part of the point. This too is probably intended by Mark as a fulfillment of Scripture. For instance, in Amos chapter 2 and verse 16, speaking of that day of dread and judgment, the prophet says, The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says Yahweh. The picture is that even the young, even the strong, even the wealthy, even the courageous are fleeing. And when you run away from Jesus, you always run away naked. Do you understand? Even if he'd been clothed, he would still be naked, metaphorically speaking. When you run away from Jesus, when you flee from, the, from Jesus in the hour of danger and the hour of trial, you do so naked. Now the early church interpreted this text as a reference to the author of the gospel, John Mark. And I see no reason to doubt that. In fact, that is, that is my own view for a number of other reasons that we could add. First of all, we know that John Mark's mother's house was in Jerusalem. And we actually see her in Acts chapter 12 hosting the Jerusalem church for prayer. And it is her house that Peter goes to when he providentially escapes prison by an angelic visitation. That suggests that this is a woman of considerable means to be able to host a large gathering in her home in that way. And the fact that Peter knows to go to her house suggests that her house is used by the apostles. Remember, there are, at that time, thousands of Christians in Jerusalem. They cannot all meet in one place. This is one of multiple references, by the way, to Presbyterianism in the New Testament, right? For those of you curious about uh, how we get to this form of government, you have the church singular in Jerusalem composed of many hundreds of house churches. We could develop that at another time. But, but Mary, his mother's name, Mary's house is evidently one of the significant places. Peter knows to go there, evidently because other apostles have used that particular gathering. And it raises the possibility, I would say very plausibly, that her house is where the Last Supper takes place and that John Mark knows that Jesus and the disciples are going out to the garden because they were at his house not long before. And he goes to bed, and someone sees Judas, and he grabs a sheet, and he runs to the garden, and he's too late, and he flees naked. All of the gospel writers, uh, Matthew, John, who were with Jesus during his life and ministry, refer to themselves anonymously in their gospels. I think that Mark does as well. Now, before we go on, I want, I want to think about two ideas 
very briefly with regard to this paragraph that we just looked at. First of all, I want to ask the question, what prophecy is being fulfilled in Jesus' arrest? Jesus says, you know, I was with you daily in the temple teaching. You could have taken me at any time, but this is happening because the scripture has to be fulfilled. And, and we say, naturally, which scripture are you talking about? Now, there are a number of passages that we could refer to, uh, Jesus being numbered with the transgressors in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, his, uh, his uh, you know, treatment as a criminal in Psalm 22. But, but I think that more likely, Jesus is referring to the totality of Old Testament typology. What I mean by that is he may not be thinking about a specific book, chapter, and verse because evidently there is not a specific book, chapter, and verse that you can say this is fulfilled here, but rather to the expectation of the Old Testament as a whole. Sometimes prophecy is a specific prediction in a specific passage with a specific historical fulfillment. You could see Micah says the, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, and sure enough, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. But let's, but let's recognize the fact that much of the prophecies in the Old Testament are not fulfilled in quite that fashion, not quite that explicitly. Oftentimes there is a larger perspective that is being fulfilled, a, a larger anticipation of Christ and of his future glory. Thus it is not merely a scripture that is being fulfilled here, but rather the scripture as a whole that's being fulfilled. This is the, the climax of the expectation of the Hebrew Bible. And I bring this up to say that we must learn to read the Old Testament as the apostles and church fathers did. Uh, a lot of pre-enlightenment reading of the Bible gets a very bad rap because admittedly during the medieval period, some of it begot, got a little bit fanciful and, and silly. Sometimes allegory ran wild. But, but I would argue that the Enlightenment put us in the ditch on the other side of the road. Remember, there are ditches on both sides, and that sometimes a commitment to historical grammatical interpretation, which we should have, by the way, becomes basically an excuse to look at the Bible in a rationalistic fashion and to simply say, I know what the word means, I know the, the semantic range, I know the, the historical background, and therefore uh, I'm done with the passage, whereas... The apostles and the church fathers would look at that text in light of the totality of the canon. And they would see Christ in places that you and I might not see him as obviously referred to. We don't want to depart into silly, inaccurate allegories. However, however, neither do we want to be modernists and rationalists when it comes to reading the Bible. We need to see that the scripture, the scripture, not just scriptures, but all the scripture is fulfilled in Jesus. And we need to be able to read the Old Testament in that fashion. Christ is on every page. By way of application, one of my favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 24 and verse 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And that's what you see happening with the apostolic band and the other disciples in this scene. Here is the hour of trial. This is the moment that all of them said they were ready for and none of them are ready for it. Right? Uh, and, and as shameful as that is, by the way, if you and I had been there, we would have been running away naked too. We, we would have fled in the same way because Scripture said that's what would happen. They abandoned Christ in His greatest need. Their earlier faithfulness, their confident commitment evaporated when it was tested by danger and confusion. Ultimately, Jesus' strength comes from His Father. He did not need them that night. He does not need you today. But... It is at the same time a sobering reminder of the difference between boasting and bravery, between profession and confession. There is a difference. One of the, one of the best things that Ahab ever said, uh, other than the, the one time he almost repented of something and then he repented of having repented, one of the best things that Ahab ever said was to the king of Syria when he reminded him, let not him who puts on his armor boast like him who takes it off. In other words, don't tell me what you're going to do. The king had said, I'm going to come and there won't be enough of Samaria left for every soldier to have a handful of dirt left, right? He says, well, we haven't fought the battle yet and you don't even know that you're going to survive. So why don't, why don't you not boast at the beginning of the battle the way that you will be entitled to boast if you survive and win the battle? 
But that, that, there's a good reminder there. We mentioned this last week with regard to the confident assertions of the apostles in the upper room to say, you and I must not trust ourselves. We must not imagine, oh, I could never abandon the Lord. I could never betray the Lord. I could never commit this or that sin. Oh, God, help me not to. God, help me not to. But, but my strength is not my security in this regard. <laughs> My commitment, my sincerity is not what's going to keep me faithful to Christ. It is the power of God brought and applied by the Holy Spirit of God that preserves me in faith. And, and in the hour of trial, it doesn't matter how well you practiced. If you're not ready in the hour of trial, well, your strength is indeed small. And of course, the point is that all of our strength is small. The apostle's strength was small. And but for the grace of God, we flee from Christ as well. So we, we rely on Christ, we rely on the Spirit, and we pray for God to preserve us rather than boasting uh, of the fact that we would not fall. We go on, verse 53 now. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed Jesus at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against Jesus, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent and answered nothing. And the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, Prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. This is another mark and sandwich but it's one of those that you may not immediately recognize. Um, in verses 53 and 54, you have the introduction of the story of Peter's denial. But you notice then we step away from it, and Mark records Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin. And then in verses 66 through the end of the chapter, Mark's going to come back to the story of Peter's denial. There are a couple of things going on here. One is that this is, this is a rather sophisticated technique for showing that these two stories are happening at the same time. He doesn't want you to think sequentially here. He wants you to think of them as concurrent, but you can't really tell them concurrently, right? I mean, that would be very confusing to just bounce back and forth constantly. Uh, and so he, he weaves them together in such a way that you understand that at the same time, that the Jewish council is denying the Messiah, Jesus' disciple Peter is denying the Messiah. And hopefully you can already get a sense of why that would be a significant parallel. But the other thing that's happening is that Mark is putting this together in a sandwich form, which we've seen over and over and over in the gospel, indicates that there is some relationship between these ideas that is brought out by whatever is in the middle. And you are helped in understanding Peter's denial by seeing the unbelief of the Jewish council that we read about in the intermediate portion. We see that uh, as he comes to uh, the courtyard, Peter is following at a distance. And remember what we just said, they forsook Jesus and fled. This following at a distance doesn't change that in any way. In fact, he is sitting with the servants of the high priest, warming himself at the fire, observing the proceedings, but desperately afraid that he will be identified. Why? Because evidently, the mob that came to arrest Jesus was grabbing disciples as they arrested him. And that's why all this young man runs away naked. Peter is afraid he's going to be taken into custody. Now, in one sense, you could say, wow, this is really kind of brave of Peter to be there at all. He's really taking a chance. But, of course, we can't really call him brave, can we? 
Because it's not physical courage that we're looking for here. It's rather the moral courage that he clearly lacks. And then Mark shifts the scene. In verse 55, he begins recounting Jesus' trial before the Jews. Now, if we put all four Gospels together and look at all of the information about Jesus' trials, you will see that there are three examinations by the Jews, followed by three examinations by the Romans. But Mark just compresses that information. He doesn't tell us about the pre-examination by Annas, the former high priest. He doesn't describe the difference between the examination by the council at night and then the condemnation at the beginning just before dawn uh, of the morning. Instead, he just kind of puts this together as a package. Again, he's moving the action forward. What he does want us to see is that it is the Sanhedrin. Verse 55, the chief priests and all the council. Now again, some commentators will say, well, obviously not all of the council is there. I say, obviously nothing. Mark says all the council is there. But I would acknowledge that Mark uses the word all to describe most or many, and he's been doing that since chapter 1. He says all the country of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out and were baptized by John. But it doesn't include the religious leadership, obviously. So all can can be an all-encompassing term without meaning every single individual. But I do want to draw your attention to the fact that all the council is there because this is a formal action of the Sanhedrin. People have observed the fact that this is an illegal proceeding and there have been debates about how to understand some of the Jewish legal practices in the Second Temple period. Regardless of whether it's legal or illegal, regardless of whether this trial is able to actually do legally what they say they do or whether they have to wait for the formal condemnation at dawn, regardless of all of that, Mark wants you to see it is the council that's doing this. It's not just Caiaphas. It's not just a few backroom power brokers. This is the organized Jewish leadership. This is the religious elite. These are the governors of the people of God. These are the pastors and elders of the visible church in Jesus' day. And they are the ones who are putting Jesus on trial in the middle of the night. And they are looking for testimony, verse 55, seeking testimony in order to put Jesus to death. Right? So I've referred to this Western before where the corrupt sheriff captures one of the good guys and says, now we're going to give you a fair trial and then a first class hanging. You say, if it's going to be a fair trial, how do you know I'm going to be hung at the end of it? They're looking for testimony to put Jesus to death. They're not looking for testimony to understand whether he's guilty. They've already decided he's guilty. They just want some legal veneer, some facade that will be adequate to cover up what they actually want to do, and that is kill this rival rabbi. And so they bring in false witnesses. Now, you would think that it would be fairly easy to put together a package of false testimony if you don't have to be troubled by the truth. You would think that it would be fairly simple. Guys, we need some kind of a capital crime here. And and so think of something and everybody get on the same page. Well, many bore false witness against him. Verse 56, apparently there were a lot of volunteers. Can you imagine, by the way, agreeing to be a false witness against Jesus? Right? This was not a good idea. Right? He is the judge of the last day. But many were willing to bear false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. You had one job, and you couldn't even pull that off. You couldn't even collude properly. Verse 57, some rose up and bore false witness, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. Well, close, kind of, not exactly. He never said that. He said something kind of like that. You remember in John chapter 2, that saying is preserved, But he doesn't say, I'm going to come and destroy the temple. That might have been a chargeable offense. (laughs) Ironically, interestingly, who is it that destroys the temple in AD 70? It was Jesus who does that. How do you know? Mark chapter 13. You will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds. It is an act of divine judgment that the Roman armies execute. So the Romans destroyed the temple. 
but they do so as authorized and empowered by Christ himself. But the point is that Jesus never says what they actually said. If they could substantiate this in any way, if they could agree together on this quotation, then perhaps the priest could charge him with threatening to desecrate the holy place. But as it is, verse 59, not even then did their testimony agree. And I don't know exactly what that means, by the way. I, you know, it, it seemed fairly simple for one of them to say, this is what he said, and everybody else says, uh-huh, yeah, that's what he said, right? That, that would seem to be fairly simple. But, but evidently, that's not what happened. Maybe they question the witnesses separately. Maybe they don't get their story straight. Maybe there are inadvertent contradictions that they make. Or maybe they discredit their, themselves in some other way. Regardless, what Mark wants you to see is that despite the best efforts of many liars, the Jews still cannot secure the kind of evidence to condemn Jesus in the way that they want to do. And so the high priest, Caiaphas, verse 60, takes matters into his own hands. Jesus is not defending himself. He better not, because if he defends himself at all, the whole case is going to fall apart, <laughs> right? He's come to be executed, and, and, and these clowns can't, can't figure out how to make that happen. He is like a lamb before the shearers. He is silent at this time. He's not here to defend himself. He is the Lamb of God come to take away the sin of the world. He is not acting as the Lion of Judah that will tear and devour his adversaries. Jesus is both, but in this type place, he is suffering in silence. Caiaphas tries to provoke him. He tries to get him to, to speak in some way, to incriminate himself. What do, you, what do you think about all this? All of these things that these people are saying, do you have no answer? Right? Is this a guilty silence? Jesus won't be baited. Then he places him under oath. Mark doesn't mention the oath. The other gospel writers do. He places him under oath. And he asks him straight out, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? The Son of the Blessed, by the way, is being used here uh, as, as just a, a restatement of the Christ. In other words, you and I look at Son of the Blessed and we think Son of God means divine Son of God. Caiaphas doesn't have a category for that. That would be blasphemy in the minds of the Jews, right? That, that's the kind of thing that the Greeks believe in with gods becoming men and having children with men. We don't believe in that, right? So when he says son of the blessed, he just simply means Messiah. But it is, it is an interesting and inadvertent admission that Jesus is not only the Messiah, son of David, he is also the son of God. And yes, that in a fully divine sense. And so Caiaphas asks him straight out, and Jesus says, I am. I am. Now, I, I am not sure that he is intending here to echo Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. Some commentators take it in that way. And it, there is no doubt that Jesus does echo that saying many times in his ministry. John draws attention to those instances. Mark does not really seem to do so. You could read this either way. It's the normal way that a person would say, yes, I am. But it could also be an echo of Yahweh's self-designation, self-identification at the burning bush. He says, I am. But then he goes beyond that. He says, and you will see the Son of Man, very clearly a self-reference here, there's no ambiguity. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power. Now, if the Jews are looking for blasphemy, there it is. Because he just said, you will see me sitting at God's right hand, which is not something that a man is allowed to do. No man could do. You will see me sitting at the right hand of the power and coming, I will come with the clouds of heaven, which is what Yahweh does in Isaiah chapter 19 when he comes to judge Egypt. And Jesus says, you're going to see me do that. And yes, he is referring to AD 70 here, at least I believe so. I think it's very clearly a reference to that. And remember that chapter 13 was all about that. And how does he refer to that day of judgment? He refers to the Son of Man riding into the city on a cloud, just as Yahweh did in the Old Testament. Now, verse 63, the high priest tears his clothes and says, that's it, we don't need any more witnesses. You all have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? Well, Tearing his clothes in symbolic horror and outrage at Jesus' obvious blasphemy was considerably more dignified than clapping his hands and shouting hurrah in relief. The Nazareth rabbi had implicated himself by doing for the Jews what the false witnesses could not manage to do. And Caiaphas says, blasphemy, 
Obviously. Maybe not so obviously. You know, there's no discussion about whether it was blasphemy, but, but why should there be? I mean, no man is qualified to say what Jesus says unless, in fact, it's true. But they don't consider that because it couldn't be true. They know that already. The council has the testimony they wanted, thanks to the defendant, and now they could proceed. And so they say, yes, he deserves to die. The Sanhedrin condemns Jesus to death. Despite the fact that they can't legally do that, despite the fact that they cannot execute sentence, John is very explicit about this, and extra-biblical history seems to corroborate this, as if we needed anything to corroborate the Bible. We don't. The Jews cannot legally execute criminals. It doesn't stop them from sometimes stoning people in mad rage, the way that they did Stephen in Acts chapter 7, but nonetheless, they do pronounce as a council that Jesus deserves to die. And this is the point at which they begin to abuse him. You and I assume that a prisoner, even a condemned prisoner, has certain basic human rights. That is not an assumption that most of the world, and certainly not historically, uh, anyone shares. And so they beat him, they abuse him, uh, and that's only the beginning of great uh, suffering and a, a long night of torture. By way of application, before we look at the last part, we need to see God's justice in man's injustice. Jesus' trial here before the Jews was a joke. It is a barely credible formality with a predetermined outcome. And yet in that act of extreme injustice, we see the greatest act of divine justice in the history of the universe. The innocent had to be tried and then had to die in place of the guilty. And even if the council struggled to pull it off, the Lord was ready and willing to overcome their incompetence in order to lay down his life for our sakes. And the treatment that Jesus receives in this trial is exactly what we deserved. His sentence was ours, but he comes as the Lamb of God to take our place on the altar of judgment. And because he is condemned in this scene, we are acquitted. So it is unjust, yes, but it is the most just thing that ever happened. It is God's justice in letting you and I go free. Now, we're going to have to hasten because we're almost out of time and we're going to run just a little bit over. But we need to see the bottom part of this sandwich. So pick up with me in verse 66. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you're one of them, for you're a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Peter is in clear line of sight to where Jesus is being examined. We know that from Luke's gospel. Luke says that when Peter denies the third time and the rooster crows, Jesus turns and looks at him. So Peter is able to see Jesus as this is going on. And yet while Jesus is being examined, Peter is having a trial of his own. There really is no comparison between the two, but we should not underestimate the challenge that Peter faces here. He is being identified by this young lady and then increasingly by more and more people in the courtyard as a co-conspirator with a man who is on trial for his life. And that is a pretty dangerous encounter. There's some question about how she's able to identify him. John tells us that the servant girl who controlled the gate, who let people in and out, presumably this same servant girl, although Mark doesn't identify her as having that job, that servant girl knew John. And presumably if she knew John, she knew that John was a follower of Jesus. And if she knew that John vouched for Peter, she can probably put two and two together and say, Peter's probably a follower of Jesus too. But there is another possibility. And that is that Jesus and his disciples have spent the last week in the city and in the temple precincts 
It's at least possible that the girl recognizes him as having seen him with Jesus at an earlier point in time. She she looks at Jesus in the firelight. He looks so familiar, and she says, you're with him too, aren't you? But he denies, "I I don't even know what you're talking about, and walks away, and the rooster crows. The rooster crows. That, that could have been like a red flag, a warning. What, do, do you realize what just happened, Peter? Do you realize what just came out of your mouth? Do you realize the dishonesty? Do you realize the deception? Do you realize the evasion? And yet he presses on. A little later, the servant girl presses the issue. She begins telling other people in the courtyard, Peter is one of those. This, this man over here, that, that guy, he must be with Jesus. But what would happen if they concluded that was the case? They tried to arrest the disciples in the garden, but Peter escaped. Now he has come into the place of danger. Would he be arrested and placed on trial? Might he be executed for a failed coup? Remember that Peter has a wife and a mother-in-law at home. He has a brother that lives with him. Presumably, Andrew is younger. He has a business to be concerned for. He he, he has a life. He has a future. There have got to be things that are going through his mind. He's afraid. He's confused. Why did Jesus not run? Why didn't Jesus resist? Why didn't Jesus allow Peter to save his life? Again, he denies his association with Jesus. But time goes by. By the way, the... the, um, I, I don't know if this is the case or not. I've never uh, spent time in Jerusalem kind of tracking the hours when roosters crow. But people have done that, and some say that they crow three times and that these first two crowings are typically one hour apart. Okay, but maybe. Maybe this is an hour, right, between the first and the second crowing. More and more people are, are paying attention to Peter and wondering. And they're, and, and they're thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe he is. And they begin listening to his speech. Now, Peter's speaking the same language, but he has a distinct accent. Galileans don't speak like Judeans. I know something about regional accents, right? You could tell where a person's from, from the way that they say certain things. And you're in the middle of the night, in the courtyard of the high priest, while a rabbi from Galilee is on trial. What's another Galilean doing there? It's not hard to figure out. They say, of course you are with him because you're a Galilean and your speech shows it. And that's when Peter begins to curse and swear and understand what's happening here. He's calling down curses upon himself. May God strike me, right? God is my witness. I don't know the man. He's also pronouncing curses on anyone who would accuse him of it. He's saying, God damn those who would think that I am with him. Think about the implications of that, brothers and sisters, right? Our society uses this kind of language flippantly. Do you realize the seriousness of saying that God ought to damn something or someone? It's a pretty pretty serious thing to say, isn't it? And yet Peter is using this to reinforce a lie. He is self-condemned. This is a tragic moment. Here is the formerly bold disciple ready to die for his master, who is involved in blatant and profane unbelief. Profane unbelief. He is taking God's name in vain in order to convince people of a lie. And then the rooster crows a second time. And Peter remembers. And he realizes what Jesus said would happen has now come true. And he weeps. Luke says he went out and wept bitterly. He ran out. This is one of the most heart-wrenching moments in all of the Gospels. But remember as well what Luke tells us. Jesus prayed for Peter. That's why Peter comes back. That's why Peter does not utterly fall, though he falls in a very painful way. You and I need to think of the pain and tragedy of this moment when we are tempted to deny Christ. I was talking with someone recently who was questioning whether they want to serve the Lord or not. Right now, they're not. But they're fearful of going all the way. They're fearful of letting go of the the remaining uh, moorings, the remaining ties to their once 
Christian profession of faith. But, but they're afraid that they're going to regret what they miss in the world if they decide to follow Jesus. But let me assure you, as I assured them, you will regret sacrificing Christ. You will not regret the things you give up in the world. You think you will today. You will not. You will regret those indulgences one day. You will regret that with shame in your mature age. But if you give up Jesus, you will certainly regret sacrificing him. Peter later repented and was restored, but the pain and regret of this memory would still remain. I'm sure there's sin like that in your life. I, I hope it's not a burden of guilt that you carry around because you know that you're forgiven by Christ. But, but surely you have things in your life that you've done, things that you've said that you will regret till the day you die. And we should regret our sin. It's good to regret our sin, not to be paralyzed by guilt, not when Jesus has forgiven us, but to be ashamed. Absolutely, we should be ashamed. And surely Peter was. Do not underestimate your ability to betray the Lord. None of us are bolder than Peter was, and yet even he fell. None are so wise, so strong, so good that they could not and would not fall if left unsupported by the Spirit. Do not trust in the strength of your faith or your commitment. Trust only in the strength of Christ's grace. That's what can make you bold in the courtyard. What you see in this sandwich are the concurrent denials of Christ by his foes and by his friend. Jesus is rejected by the Jews and he is rejected by a member of his inner circle, a man who knew him so well and who was the first one to confess that he was, in fact, the Christ. In this moment, the Lord appears utterly forsaken, and yet He is not, because the Father will not abandon His righteous one. We'll say more about that when we come to the cross. This is a very dark moment, but it is a very necessary one, because what you and I need to see at this place is that everybody in the story except Jesus needs grace. Peter is the most righteous disciple, so you would think, and yet Peter is cursing using the name of God, denying that he has anything to do with Jesus. The Gospels do not tell us a story of heroes and villains. In the Gospels, there is only one hero, and it isn't Peter. Peter was a sinner who needed grace, just like every other sinner in the story. And while we may rightly denounce the Sanhedrin for the great wickedness of their condemnation of Christ, we best remember that we need salvation just as much as they do. We need grace. We need mercy. We're like Peter. You may say, I would never have sat on that council and condemned the Lord. It's probably not true, but let's say that it was true. Would you have stood in the courtyard like Peter and cursed and swore that you'd never knew him? By way of application, as we close, we need to distinguish physical and moral courage. Peter has the first, like plenty of it, He's got a lot of courage. This is a bold man. I mean, after all, this is the man who in the middle of the night during uh, 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 you know, rough waters at sea asks this apparition, this ghostly figure standing out on the water, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. If I'm Andrew, I'm looking over at Peter like, are you crazy? What are you, what are you thinking? This is the man who just hours before drew a sword ready to give his life just to buy Jesus time to get away. He's got plenty of physical courage, but he lacks moral courage in this moment. And how does that happen? There are a lot of factors, no doubt. Confusion. Confusion makes you vulnerable. When you don't know why things are happening, when God doesn't meet your expectations, when disaster strikes your children, your spouse, your life, and you wonder, Lord, why is this going on? What are you doing? Be aware of the fact that you are vulnerable at that moment. Self-confidence, it could never happen to me. I would never do that. Be aware of the fact that you're vulnerable. How about neglect of prayer? Where was Peter while Jesus was praying? Peter was sleeping. He may be well rested. He was not well prepared for that trial. How about fear? He's afraid he's going to be arrested. Maybe put on trial as well. Maybe executed. Fear makes us do bad things. Fear doesn't lead to good decisions. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. What about anger? You think Peter's angry? I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that he might be. He 
He's certainly frustrated. I can imagine he's upset. We don't make good decisions when we're angry. All of these and maybe many more things contributed to this scene. What did Jesus say to Peter in the garden? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. The spirit may be willing, and Peter's spirit certainly was willing, but his flesh was weak. We stand by grace. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. Gracious God and Father, we, we want to know ourselves as the sinners that we are. We are thankful that we are your children. We are thankful that we are forgiven. We are thankful that we are indwelt by your Spirit. And we are thankful that we are preserved for everlasting life. And yet we know, Father, the very real danger that we could become self-confident. And then in that hour of trial, our proud boasting would be proved to be nothing. Oh Lord, how thankful we are for Jesus and for His composure and for His courage and for His constancy and for His heroic service on behalf of cowardly sinners because that's who we are and we needed a Savior. Father, we thank You so much for sending Your Son into this world, the Son of the Blessed, the Son of Your right hand, the King who has given all authority in heaven and on earth, that He might pay the price for our sakes, that He might receive the punishment for our sins, and then rise the third day, that we might be justified once and for all time. Bless us, keep us, watch over us as we return to our homes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.